Hi everyone, I'm Harv, Ian Harvey, founder of Collective Intelligence, and this is Stuff That Matters Now. Okay, welcome back everybody. I am in, uh, I was going to say downtown Wellington, but it's not, we're on Mount Victoria Mm -hmm. uh, in Wellington, and I am talking to biotech entrepreneur Veronica Howard-Stevenson, and I am... Uh, I'm really looking forward to this because I haven't caught up with Veronica for a wee while. It's been ages. And it's been ages and you've missed me. So Veronica, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and Veronica is uh, is different to a lot of other people I've interviewed in that you've got a wonderful company called Humble Bee and we're going to dive straight into that to start off with and explain what Humble Bee is so we get the picture of what a biotech entrepreneur is and what they do. So, Veronica, welcome. And let's just kick off with that. What is Humble Bee? Humble Bee is a, a biotech company that finds and validates and then sells um, natural products that are, that are naturally occurring, so that exist in nature, um, that are non-hazardous. And we... Uh, commercialising our first product that we're commercialising is inspired by the nesting material of a solitary bee and it's got very useful industrial properties in terms of water resistance and heat resistance uh, and chemical resistance which are essential properties in textiles um, and fabric um, industries and the current chemistry that is used in those industries for those properties are highly toxic so the major motivation for me in starting this business was how does nature do some of the industrial processes that we value so highly um, in our consumer markets um, and how does it do them without poisoning itself? Um, and so we are inspired by nature and using the genes from nature to recreate the materials that exist there. Okay, so... Today, you've got to talk to me like a Labrador. Okay. Okay. Uh, and be nice because uh, I, I I get the concept and uh-huh. I go, there's I, there's a whole... So, who's we? When you talk about Humblebee, who's we? Uh, so, I'm the CEO. Yep. Um, we have a great governance board and we have um, research providers all around the world and we have um, advisory boards... So it's a very multidisciplinary product, um, team. So you have bioengineers, uh, bioinformaticians, um, geneticists and chemists and material specialists and degradation specialists. And, you know, I mean, these are all people who are really, really deep, deep technical experts in their field. And so sometimes you'll have, I'll have my organic chemist be like, I don't know, I'm not a biochemist. And I'm like, oh, yes, we have to bridge that gap. <laughs> um, and, yeah. So, Veronica, what – so going back and being nice to the Labrador, if we you talk about the genetic makeup and, and so forth. Mm. So, so take me back to did you identify a problem or did you identify an opportunity that you saw with the bees? Where does something – where does an idea like this start? It started when I was studying reproductive biology at university and we were learning about the things that disrupt normal fertility and hormone regulation. Um, And we were learning about things like rubella and thalidomide and um, hazardous chemicals that if you expose a, a, a human to or a fetus to, we know cause damage, long-term damage, um, or massively increase the incidence or likelihood of cancers and immune diseases and hormone disorders. Uh, And a lot of the examples that uh, my professor was using were things that we had phased out because we knew how bad they were. And then there were some that weren't being phased out or or were being used on the kind of hundreds of thousands of tonne scale. And I remember thinking at some point in the future this is going to be a market opportunity because there's no way that this kind of 
scientific literature gets published and someone doesn't, um, there's not a regulatory response eventually. It's slow, but it eventually would happen. And I just kept an eye on it. And then about eight years later, sure enough, scientists started lobbying the World Health Organization, the UN, regulatory shifts started happening internationally. Give us a, give us a specific idea of what one of those compounds would be. Um, there's a class of compounds called perfluorinated carbons, uh, which are known to cause increased incidences of um, ulcerative colitis, um, increased cholesterol, um, and reduce vaccination efficacy in children, cause tumours in multiple organ systems. Uh, and we've, we know that. And they're used um, in so many consumer goods. Are we allowed to name those? or? Um, well, Teflon was the major one, but like they were used in pizza boxes to stop them from wetting out. Um, they're not used in those anymore. Um, they're used on carpets and curtains and the the fabric that goes on aeroplanes and cars. Um, so, you know, fairly ubiquitously used. The, the, yeah. the lining of popcorn bags. Fuck, brilliant. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. Right. Yeah. So... That you saw that as an opportunity to do what? I was just kind of, I was kind of enraged that you would be allowed to pollute knowingly on such a massive scale, and and the and the kind of the destruction and 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 hurt that that causes. I mean, there's a lot more awareness about it now. There's a uh, a company, that, a venture, venture capital company, that was started by a woman who, very wealthy, when she went to have, ch- have children, um, found that she couldn't because she'd been exposed to something when she was very young. And there are, I think, a lot of, there's a lot of that. Um, and so there's, kind of social stability and there's a moral element to it as well. It's like you I don't think it's right that companies in the pursuit of profit rob these rob someone of the ability to have children yep. or rob someone of good health. Uh, so it's yeah, kind of a consumer rights issue from my perspective, as well as an ethical one, um, as well as a kind of social stability, because I think if you get to a point where you have polluted the population, um with a body burden of chemicals that cause masses of health problems, that puts pressure on a society that we are not equipped to deal with from a health system, from um, a reproductive perspective. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think it's a bit fragile right. to be doing things like that. And so eight years after Varsity, you're going, okay, so this here's the problem that's emerged what what happened next? I started looking at the ways that nature waterproofs, because um, I had a biology background, and I thought, I mean, don't get me wrong, not everything that is natural is good. I mean, asbestos is a, is a natural compound. Um, is it? It is. Um, so that people conflate the two often. Okay. Um, you know, coronavirus is natural, naturally yep. occurring thing. Viruses are. So uh, compounds that exist in nature are not necessarily not hazardous. Yep. Um, and so I went about looking at things that um, were waterproof uh, or, or, or that nature used for waterproofing and were used in such a way that indicated that they might be non-toxic. Mm-hmm. And when I came across the nesting material of the solitary bee, I'm like, it's lining its nest and storing its larvae inside this nest. And then the larvae are thought to eat their way out. The chances of that being highly toxic to a, um, are small. And what's the bee called? It's part of the Hylaeus family. Mm-hmm. And so it's an old bee. It 
about 25 million years old. Um, and do you know that bees are just uh, vegetarian wasps? They branched off. Really? Yeah. The shit you learn on a podcast. So a vegetarian wasp. So a wasp eats meat, mm-hmm. and these suckers don't. Pollen and nectar and... Ah. Yeah. The things you learn when you do biology. There you go. There you yeah. go. So, okay, so, and how many bees did you study before you found this one and went, oh, I'm going to dig into this this one? Was it lots, or did you hone in on this quite quickly? We honed in on um, this family of bees, um, and we identified one that, so there had been a bit of literature on this family of bees. And we identified... Well, I guess after 25 million years, it would be a reasonable track record. People right? had some entomologists had done some research on it, and we identified um, one that was closely related to the literature. Yep. We've been studying the literature, and that I could get hold of um, in Australia. Um, and then we got hold of some of the nesting material, and we Where, did... Whereabouts in Australia? In a tiny town in Queensland called Kinkin. Right. So I just basically started cold calling people in Australia who knew about bees uh, and then I came across a guy called Chris Fuller who runs a native bee pollination services company um, and cause in Australia they've got significantly more understanding of the use of their native um, species for pollination services than we do in New Zealand. They're like I think 50% reliant on honeybees whereas we're like 80% reliant on honeybees. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I called him and said, this is what I'm trying to do. Would you be able to get me some of the material? This is the, um, the species of bee I'm after. And he went, oh, yeah, I reckon we'll be able to do that. Uh, and so he put some, some nesting boxes out. And I'd never met the guy. Um, and we put them out for a summer. And they were full. And then we had them. Full of what? Full of the nest material. Right. Yeah. So the bees found the boxes. Oh, they found the boxes. I mean, cool. We're in, into this. Yep, we're into this. It, we, it had been. They're quite fussy. They like, you know, partial sun, um, dappled light. They like to be proximity to water and nectar and pollen. You know, like they're twenty-five million years old and they're fussy. Ref, well, yeah, they've got refined tastes. They've had right, plenty of right, time. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So you've got, and, uh, and had you gone? This guy had done this all for you. For, so you hadn't gone over there. No. Right. And then he sent them to New Zealand uh, to be analysed, and um, they got lost in the mail. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> For months. They just vanished. Um, and then, you know, I was on the phone to all these, like, just ringing around post offices. Um, and you Have know, you seen my box of bees? At, well, they weren't live bees. You can't, no, no, you can't see bees. Yeah. I said, you know, it's biological material. Da, da, da. It's got a permit attached to it. It really should have been quite noticeable. Oh. Um, and eventually it just showed up. Like, I don't know where it had gone. Anyway, um, that, that was, was very that, stressful. That was a good day. It was a good day. It was a good day. And we, we learned the lesson of posting these things in increments. So the next time we did this, we started, we didn't put all our eggs in one basket or all our bees in one box. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and so we had it analysed and it performed performed well. Uh, and we thought, right, okay. What does that mean, perform well? So there is a standard test, a hydrophobic test called a contact angle test. Um, and it indicated that it was hydrophobic, um, as the literature had suggested. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it displayed self-extinguishing behaviour, which means that when you light it on fire and then you take away the flame, it goes out oh, yeah. by itself, um, which is um, beneficial in uh, the textile sector because you have to apply flame retardants if you want to sell in North America. Um, and uh, it didn't melt, which we thought was useful because um, often synthetic fibers, if you put them on you, if you, if, you know, if you get if you get burnt when you're wearing polyester um, or polypropylene or something like that, that's going to stick. So all these things indicating that it was potentially going to be useful in the textiles market, the market we had identified, be safer in a few ways. And so 
Um, I needed to find some more money in order to... So just go back. Are we excited at this point, Veronica? We are excited. We're excited, but we're also... Uh, broke and excited and broke and broke because I've spent my life savings on that yep. analysis and I went down to Dunedin to study a master's because I thought this biotech thing's a long shot I'm going to have to have a backup plan so I decided to do a master's in science communication and filmmaking which has actually turned out to be very useful in the endeavor um, of starting a biotech company because it's taught me a lot about communication and how to um, communicate complicated subject matter um, in, a, in an easier in an easier way. Was it hard parking it? I didn't park it, I did both. Right. Um, which was hard. Um, I also decided I would, also, would do two operas at the same time and have a part-time job. So I had... This research project. Two operas. Mm-hmm. All right. So I had this research project, a part-time job, a full, full-time, like kind of a 60-hour-a-week um, master's program, and um, and two operas that I was rehearsing for. What did you do in the opera? I sang. Are you a singer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I interviewed an opera singer not that long ago, oh, Anna Perard. Yeah. Cool. And I'm going, goodness, what's such a... I didn't know that. Yeah. Ah. Uh, and that was really, really hard. Like, I kind of just bit off more than I could chew. I had finished... Um, is that a theme of your life? It is a bit. But here's the thing, is that when I first started Humblebee, I was working at a, at, um, a great business called NZ On Screen, uh, which basically houses and showcases New Zealand's content like from 1914 to, to now and it's free and online. It's an amazing resource. Anyway, I was working four days a week there and it was a, it was a job that was not massively demanding and I had all, these, all this energy. I felt very rested and so I was like, I can do anything. I'm going to do the... Yeah, and then that... I basically depleted all my resources in about nine months. I ended up in hospital with a self-induced um, uh, ulcer that was going to burst and... Go you. Yeah. That was yeah, good planning. It's great. So you're broke, but you're excited. How do you fund going and doing a master's? Well, it was about three or four months before National cut the um, postgraduate student allowance. So the master's went from costing, you know, fifteen or seventeen thousand dollars to costing thirty in terms of accessing that capital. Right. So um, that's why I had to get a part time job. Right. Yep. Cool. And and then Humblebee is just quietly, what are you doing with Humblebee through that time? So the research partner that we had, that I had given my life savings to, to do the in, initial analysis, said we were, we're really interested in this as well. Yep. Um, and we'd like to allocate some of our funding, our internal funding, to the next phase of work, which was to try and kind of dissolve the nesting material and see whether or not we could reapply it to a fabric as a method of um, testing it on a, on a, a bit of fabric. So when you dissolve it... Well, here's the thing. You couldn't dissolve it. We didn't know that, but eventually we found out you couldn't dissolve it. Okay. Which is what the, the, the chemical and solvent resistance part of the properties um, became known. So that is that stage. a good thing to have? It's it's a really good thing to have, um, but not if you're wanting to try and apply it to something. Right. Um, and so I'll get to and so our manufacturing method now um, that we're that we're starting to test will have to incorporate um, kind of some techniques that will mean that it it won't be insoluble at the moment that it is expressed from its microbial host. So we might be getting a bit of a hit of ourselves um, because you don't want the you don't want the raw product to be so insoluble that it can't be applied and manipulated and used in manufacturing processes. But the fact that it is very resistant um, and robust in its final form is very useful. 
Okay, so here's yeah. another Labrador question. Okay. You're working with real material created by a bee. Yeah, we were at that point, yes. Okay. And then going forward, because that bee can only produce so much product. Yes. So are you looking to recreate that product in a, um artificial way? Yeah. Wow. That was a wild guess. Go oh. oh, me. I know. Labradors I, are smarter than they look. Hey, go Labrador. So, <laughs> okay, so so then you, you work out the compound and then you can artificially reproduce it. So we worked out what we thought was the compound and we went, oh, okay. So if we get this raw material um, that's abundant and we can buy relatively cheaply and we alter it, with a chemical route and various reactions, um, then we get to um, some molecules that we can join together and they're going to be the, a, a synthetic approximation of the nesting material. And we were like, great, awesome. And we filed a provisional patent around that route. And, um, and then it was going to be too expensive. And then we did some more analysis on the actual nesting material and found out that it was what we had created was only a small component of the actual material. Right. Um, and that came about when we did uh, the gene sequencing as well. Um, so what we're going to use is the, the gene that encodes for the bulk of the nest material and express that gene in um, an engineered organism. Okay, the Labrador's nodding. Yep. yep. Kind of like how insulin is made. Okay. So insulin is expressed in E. coli um, and then fermented and the E. coli reproduces and so does the insulin. Okay. And that's a field of um, bioengineering and synthetic biology that has advanced massively in the last 40 years. So I'm going to jump in with a, a, a question just to give myself a breather. But uh, what's what's Veronica? What's your what's your thing? What are you really good at in this field? I mean, as the CEO and the only full-time employee of a startup, you have to be good at like, so many things. Um, you have to be good at sifting through the market research and seeing where you would fit and looking at the mergers and acquisitions of companies that you think you could be um, bought by and going, all right, what's their strategy based on who they're buying? Um, you have to be able to design uh, methodologies and research experiments or at least check them and make sure that they're going to do what you want them to do. Uh, you have to be able to interpret the results. You have to be able to bridge those results with all of the other disciplines that you are commissioning work from. You have to interpret those results and translate them into something that is useful to your board who are helping you with your strategy and to your investors. So... All of those things. And that's you? Yeah. And does that make you a, a generalist in this biotech field? A little bit, because I think in a larger company, you'd have a CTO who would be doing quite a bit of that work. Yep. Um, yeah. And do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy that breadth of, of work? I have done in the past. I feel like at the moment um, we've probably reached a threshold where going into this next capital, next round. So we've just finished a capital raise um, in the last couple of days. We raised um, uh, four hundred thousand, and then um, we got a, an R and D loan from the government, which is another four hundred thousand. So we're kind of really well equipped to go into this next stage of work. But we'll be working with way more R and D partners right. um, with. Um, more complicated and nuanced milestones um, and, and go no go points like if this doesn't work then 
stop um, and and reevaluate. So there's going to be there's it's going to be too much at that point. So um, I'm in the process of making some key hires at the moment that will mean that I can uh, focus a little bit more on growing the business from a BD perspective, lining up um, business development perspective, yep. lining up um, potential acquirers, potential customers, really getting going deeper into our market um, and starting to build relationships with investors for the Series A. So when we have expressed the nest material protein in a microbe, we've proven that it's akin to the nest material. Um, And then we'll be looking to raise many millions of dollars to scale that production. So that then... then, uh... So up until now, it has mm-hmm. been research and development, mm-hmm. and uh, who, what sort of people invest in something like this, or organisations? I mean, we're still R and D. There's a very useful scale which I have come to realise is what people are actually asking when they say, "What stage are you at?" Um, and it's the technology readiness scale, the TLR, TR, um, TRL, technology readiness level. Um, and it was developed by NASA during the space race. Um, zero, you know, one being an idea on a napkin, nine being um, a fully supported product in the market. And each step um, from one to nine has a discrete um, capability as you move through the ranks. And we're at a kind of three to four now, and we want to be to at a six pretty soon, um, well, um, within about a year and a half. Um, and then we'll be moving out of the realms of R&D right. and into product development. And so at a six, that's when you start looking at raising millions of dollars to then to move scale. it forward. Yeah. So from a one to a nine, yeah. for Humblebee, yeah. how... How many years is that? Um, well, I started this in 2000, the end of 2010, but we didn't start the research on it until the original research on it until 2012. I then did a master's. I got a full-time job. Went to opera. Yeah, all of that stuff. So, like, I've only really been working on it full-time full tilt for the last three and a half years. And I, I don't think that's unusual. I mean, I remember talking to the, some of the founders of Zero. They they sat on that for a while. They didn't do anything with it for a while. And that's, you know, that's mm. simple compared to what you're doing. Well, I think actually at, at the time I was really frustrated by how long it all took. But now we're here and I'm looking at how we're going to scale and produce our product and going, actually, in terms of the technological advancements, that's probably the, about the right time to be trying to do this because the ability to produce things um, using genetic engineering um, and, and micro production has only got to a point where the yield and the efficiency of it um, were such that you were going to meet the kind of cost of goods that, that the market could bear. Because yep. previously, this kind of technology was reserved for pharmaceuticals. Yep. Yeah. The Veronica that started with Humblebee and the Veronica today, mm-hmm. what's the difference between those two people? A lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge. Um, Probably less, um, I was always really reluctant when people would talk about you've cre- you're, in- you're inventing a new type of plastic and it's going to solve the world's plastic pollution. Um, I really, in- initially I was so caught up in the, like, the enthusiasm that it was going to have such a huge impact that I didn't resist that kind of narrative. Um, but the further and further I've got along, the more 
I don't I re- have resisted um, kind of push back on that sensationalist angle because I don't think it's I don't think it's helpful. It's just kind of clickbaity, and it's not it's not accurate. And I think there's this real sense, and it you know it applies across a lot of different areas in society these days. People just want there to be one answer. Yes. Um, and you know what place of pollution doesn't have one answer, and so now I pick, pick, pull people up on it when they are like want to run I'm with the tagline. I'm very pleased I didn't do that today because I mean I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that, and it sounds pretty cool. It's great. Here's the thing with plastic. People go, oh, you know, so you're going to replace plastic bags and plastic bottles. And I'm like, there are different types of plastic. If I had told you I had invented a new type of metal, you wouldn't then think that every type of metal would be replaced by that thing because you understand that aluminium has very different properties to steel and gold in terms of its strength, its conductivity, all of that stuff, Um, and plastic similarly. Right. Right. Well, I'm very pleased I didn't blunder into that one today and get told off. <laughs> and and so you've described knowledge. What else? How else have you changed through this process? I don't know. I think. Um... Clearly, I need to spend more time in um, self self reflection. <laughs> um, no, and 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 I'm okay with don't know. How have I changed? I just feel more equipped. I mean, I went into it, and actually, this is where um, CQ helped, helped me massively because I got an offer from an investor early on and he put a deadline on it and I called one of my team members and I was like, this just feels a bit weird. Um, and he went, those terms are monstrous. And he, he, he's, he's putting the pressure on because he knows they're monstrous and he wants you to panic and not think about them. And he was right. So, and now if that kind of thing happened, I just, I wouldn't have even considered it. I'd be like, yeah, you're not the kind of investor I want. It's it's interesting, uh, Veronica, because I, you know I hear that a lot within collective intelligence teams where somebody gets something and there's a pressure on whatever, and it's bloody good to have somebody just reach out and go, mm. "What do you think of this?" You yeah, know, that is absolute crap. I was I, I, look, I would have seen that dozens of times. Yeah, yeah, and just a bit in the moment because piece basically people are just preying on you. Yeah, at that time, what? <sighs> We'll get back on track soon. But I... Have there been times you've just wanted to give it away? Oh, so many. <laughs> so many. Um, there was one time in particular where I'd just broken up from a six-and-a-half-year relationship. Um, and I was using my savings to fund the company. And I was living on friends' couches. Like, I was like, this is really rock bottom. Um, I have no home and no income, and I'm hemorrhaging my savings. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I've made some really shitty life choices here. And questioned it so much. Um, And then, and then, you know, something changed. Like, I got a house, and we got a Callahan grant, and I got some investors, and... I was able to pay myself again, and and you keep going. But there have been lots of times where it's got really, really, really hard, and you've wanted to just do something easier. Yep. Yep. So back to Humble Bee. Yes. Could you frame up for us where Humble Bee is today? So what? Where are you at with the developing? Technically, the product. Mm-hmm. Can you give us an idea of what that looks like? So we've analysed the nest material in terms of its properties. We have decided they are valuable enough that we want to find a way to manufacture them. We have sequenced the genome of the bee. We found 
the location of the gene that codes for the nest material. We re- Hang on, don't understand that. Okay, so um, if you think about your your gene, your entire genome as, as a recipe book, mm-hmm. and we found a particular recipe, and we know exactly, and we know where it is. Right. Yep. And we ran that recipe through a database of every known recipe from every recipe book, just to kind of, you know, push the metaphor. Uh, and we found that it was novel. So it wasn't seen in any other. That's pretty exciting. It's exciting. So we're drafting a pattern around that. Right. And then the capital that we've just raised now, um, we will use to refine that gene sequence. And by refine, this is the cool thing about this kind of technology, is it's um, it's tailorable. So you can take that gene sequence and you can put it into a computer model and you can understand its properties and how it will react with other molecules. And you can go... With how much accuracy? It depends a little bit on the gene sequence. Right. So whether it's a protein or an enzyme or... Um, so... But accurate enough that you you know you base some strategic right. decisions around okay. it, um, and this is the kind of software that was used by the pharmaceutical industry to kind of go, well, you know, how bioactive is this compound? Is it worth making a drug out of it? Is it going to ha- have a half life yep. of da da da? Is it going to immediately react and be neutralized by something in the body? That kind of stuff. Um, and you can look at that gene sequence and go, look, if we change that and that, it will have this impact on its properties. And then that will be very useful in this market or for this customer. And so then that one, your kind of primary gene sequence becomes your kind of master sequence from which you can deviate and create different properties, different, mm. mater- different materials with different properties. Mm. Yeah. What's the most exciting day you've had with Humblebee? What's been the, the, this is... Off the planet stuff. Do you know this is going to sound really sad, but I've learned not to indulge those days right. because if you attach your your happiness to something going well in the company, you go along on the roller coaster of the company on a very personal level. Yeah. So. And I did. I made that mistake early on. And I was going to say this. This sounds like something you've learned. It is definitely something I've learned, and it's something that when I talk to other entrepreneurs about, um, particularly the earlier stage entrepreneurs, they're like, "How do you detach your sense of value and self from the business?" And the way that I have figured out how to do that is not to kind of celebrate too much if you know what I mean like you celebrate your wins it's like yes we've just closed it sounds a bit sad I know it does um but you can I celebrate my wins as opportunities and not as moments of congratulations or euphoria okay so indulge me I've got that Mm -hmm. what has been the most the biggest moment for you since with the journey Or moments. Moments. Thank you. Uh, finding Richard Furno, who um, was uh, the lead researcher and one of the best chemists in Australasia, and him joining the project, and the what that unlocked in terms of the credibility, the research partner, it was costed. We could like go out to investors with this really nice proposal. Um, they knew what was going to be achieved. They felt really comfortable with it. There was, you know, reputational um, robustness around yep. it. Uh, so it wasn't just me, you know, this kind of 25 year old with an idea. Right. Yep. Right. So not technical, personal. Interesting, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and then, and here's another, another reason why you don't celebrate is like, I did celebrate when we got the quality control back from, um, the genome sequences that we've got a, we've got a full library. Uh, and then I sent it to my bioinformatician. So he's the guy that assembles the library and he's like, well, you know, we should have kind of chromosomal clusters of data. Um, and we've got 20,000 fragments. So that's not useful. And I'm like, oh, how did that happen? You know, like, <laughs> and he said, well, and then, so we went back to the methodology that had been used and what they'd done is that they'd applied a really standard procedure to our sample, which is a, a procedure called a PCR which stands for polymerase chain reaction, right. which basically is a, an amplification method. So you can get a small piece of DNA and then you break it up and then you add in the, the kind of components of DNA and it um, amplifies. Uh, and so you end up with a heap, a heap more of that same fragment of DNA. But what they'd done with our B samples is they had mushed them up non-uniformly and bees are exo skeletal so their mm -hmm. their bones are on the outside of their body and so you had these kind of like chunks of bone essentially chunks of their shell and then their tissue and so in a non-uniform sample you get exposure to the amplification non-uniformly and so some genes were massively amplified and other others just weren't at all and so you ended up with garbage dna um so don't celebrate too early. So you'd have the big celebration over junk. Yep. That, yep. Yep. Sometimes people say, how's your day going? I say, with the information I've got, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, with a bit more information, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Yeah. yeah. That would be tough. That so I mean, the day that we got the great the QC result was a great day, but retrospectively, it wasn't it wasn't a great day. Yeah. Um, so, Veronica, changing focus, like, is there anything else we need to delve into with Humblebee? Anything we've missed? Um, well, this is your show, so you can ask me anything you want about it. But I, uh, yeah, I will. I'm yeah. asking you. <laughs> is there anything? No, I'm happy. No, to happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's move the focus to the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and you're a fellow. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And cohort number? I'm in Cochia. So the I don't go by the numbers. Right. Because um, we were given a name by Pekaida, um, who spent a lot of time thinking about the people in it. Yes. And the kind of... Rongo or um, native medicine plant yes. that we would be, um, and we are gifted this name, and not to use it feels very disrespectful. Cool. So I'm in Kohia. Okay. Mm. And you have been a fellow for how long? Two years. And so framing up for listeners, what would you? How would you describe the Edmund Hillary Fellowship? A grand experiment on attracting talent to New Zealand, mm -hmm. talented investors um, and talented people who want to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So the catchphrase for the Edmund Hillary Fellow is um, Aotearoa Base Camp for a Better World. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you have a, a visa to get to New Zealand based on your track record and your intention for making a positive difference in the world mm -hmm. at quite a big scale. And they have 80% of their cohorts uh, international mm -hmm. and then 20% are local. And mm -hmm. you want your local to be friendly and well-connected um, to help those internationals be embedded in the ecosystem. And I'm one of the locals. And how did you... What's the process to become a fellow? You apply, which is... You know, it was a decent application process. Yep. Um, and then they interview you twice. And they had, I think they wanted six references. So three were written, three were person, in person. And they wanted 
you know, professional references as well as personal references. Mm-hmm. So I, had to, you know, I found um, friends who I'd had who'd known me for twenty years, yeah. and some of the questions that they asked were like, "What are her, what are her weaknesses? What's she not good at?" Um, and celebrating too soon was one. Celebrating too soon. <laughs> um, actually, I did ask uh, giving too much. Right. Yeah, we're doing too much. Spreading myself too thin. So what impact has the becoming a fellow, mm-hmm. um, no, 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 go back. So you have a, an intake, okay, you have a, you have a, cohort. Day, eight, mm. a cohort, 80% international, 20% Locals. local, mm-hmm. are they, this, are they the same type of people? No, I think they've gone for diversity, um, Deliberately so. Mm. So what? 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 Um, and the the. So how would you describe? So the change makers. Mm. Yeah. Consciousness raiser, things, change makers, investors. Um, yeah. And what, dreamers. And and dreamers. And so you becoming into that ecosystem. Mm-hmm. What impact has that had on you and Humble Bee? One of the things that I love about my job is that I am exposed to people and opportunities that I wouldn't otherwise be in a, in a, in a quote-unquote normal job. Um, and it just was, that was like, EHF was that on steroids. It was people who wanted to talk big stuff about cool things that I would never have heard about otherwise. Uh, and you, they come together physically? Yeah. How often? Once a year, is it, or, or more? Once. I mean, COVID has interrupted the, um, the, so, the socialising aspect of it. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, once a year there was a, a hui yep. um, that was planned. And... The the internationals bring their companies or families to New Zealand, is that right? They're meant to, or they they can. Um, some uh, choose to come occasionally yep. um, and spend time here, and then others move their whole families and their businesses more permanently. Uh, so there's kind of a sliding scale. There's not you you don't have to do that, uh, but there are there are those who who, who do who choose to yeah and. Because I was at the launch of the, the first night when they launched it in Wellington here, and they had, I can't remember his name, it was the National Party Minister of Immigration or whatever, and mm-hmm. it was to celebrate this fast-track visa for mm-hmm. these guys coming out. Mm-hmm. And it was a big deal. Yeah. Big it's the deal. first of its kind in the world. Yeah. And will they, will these entrepreneurs and so forth settle here, do you think? Some of them have, some of them will, some of them, you know, already are well established. Yep. Um, and some of them have given an enormous amount back already. For example, um, one of my investors, um, Martin Kraft, introduced me to his cousin in Germany, who works as the chief sustainability officer in, um, at a textiles company in Germany. And he's now an investor and very, very, very useful. With that investment from somebody like that, mm. are they are they looking at then getting closer to you and Humble Bee to be what's the word? Get first access to the when you when you when it becomes commercial or what's in it for them to do that? To invest. Yeah. For somebody like that from Germany, what's what's in it for them? To get to get access yep. to an emerging piece of technology for yep. their market um, that's solving a problem that they can see is a real you know a real problem, yep. um, and because they can, I think people want to want to be part of the solution. Which is a big part of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Huge driver to create a better world. Yeah. Who instigated the this thing? Do you know? No. 
Sorry. No, no, I'm just... Because I know a number of people who have been involved, like Anika Guru is the chair mm-hmm. of Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and there's... I've known other people. I've never known, actually, where did it start? What was it? And it's, you know, coming through. It's and, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, and, but looking from the outside, you know, it's... Yeah, it's it's a really... It's a, a fabulous concept fabulous concept yeah it's one that i think ought to be applied across our investor migrant visa um program that we have in new zealand because at the moment you can buy a visa you can buy a residency in new zealand um for two to five million um and be anonymous put all of that capital into government bonds or real estate and have no contact with the ecosystem and and have no kind of onboarding onto what it means to be a New Zealander and what it means to... Is that how it happens? I've always wondered. Yeah. So you can just buy your way into New Zealand? Mm-hmm. Right. And it's a really... A, it's insanely cheap. Like, we're very much selling ourselves short and B we're not getting the kind of people who want to do amazing things in New Zealand right it's a transaction it's a it's very much a transaction and I think the risk of that is that you end up attracting people who are wealthy um, who have potentially um, just wanting a bolt hole from a world that they may or may not have contributed to, you know. Right. Um, so, whereas the people who are coming to New Zealand from through the Edmund Hillary Fellowship are really engaged and they want to meet people and they are investing in companies um, and hiring people and making connections and introducing and and you know, making the gap between New Zealand and international expertise and investment um, and markets much smaller. And the the Maori culture is a big deal with the fellowship too, isn't it? Yeah. And that's the other thing that doesn't happen if you're an investor migrant. You have no understanding of te kanga Māori or how, how important it is. Right. Yeah. Did you... Was it the first time you'd applied for the fellowship? Yes, it was. Did you expect to get it? I I knew I would add a lot of value, but I didn't expect to get it. Right. So it was it was so how do you find out that you're a fellow? How do they tell you? I think they emailed us or they called us. Yeah. That would have felt pretty cool. Yeah, it was very cool. It was really exciting because you the people involved, uh, having proximity and being able to just email those people. Um, I feel very, very honoured to be part of a network like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh yeah, and it's it doesn't get a lot of publicity as such, does it? But I think it's getting more and more known all the time. You know, I was, I was talking, I was at Callahan yesterday, and you know, it came up and they talked about the fellows and. It's a long know, it's, game, yeah. and I think that that it hasn't been funded again. So the cohorts that. Are now accepted. Are the, it's, that's kind of it for now. Um, and this kind of thing takes a while to settle and takes a while to take root and to proliferate. Yeah. And there's just no doubt that it will. It's one of those things that the government's like, we want to be able to measure the impact. It's like, well, you've gone, you've planted a garden, and then you're coming at a time when things are just starting to flower and you're wondering how big the crop's going to be. It's kind of, it's just really premature. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there will be fruit. Yeah. Look, I've, just from, because uh, they have the New Frontiers, I think is what it's called, when you come together once a year. And I was keen to go along to it last year mm. and I, I couldn't, and in the end I, it was cancelled, I think, because of COVID. Mm. But, um uh, I have seen some of the videos that have come out of there, and uh, uh, Alina Siegfried has been involved in it. And you know, Alina 
um, delivered this amazing poem that you know is one of my favourite at that. And I've seen different people speak at it, and and you just look at the people involved, and it's just profoundly positive. Yeah. Profoundly positive. Yeah. Yeah. What's so? What's the future for you, Veronica? What's the what's the bigger picture for you going forward? Well, um, we're going to express this protein. Uh, I'm going to make some hires, and we're just going to focus on getting that proof of concept down. One thing I want to do this coming year is run an event that I had been meaning to run for a good many years now, which, uh, and I think this will help long term, really, really help the New Zealand economy. Uh, and that is to run an intellectual property negotiation. Uh, course and workshop for students because particularly in the science sector I mean we keep saying we want less agriculture and tourism and yet we have bottlenecked all of our science and technological development into academic institutions who for the most part and there are exceptions take all of the IP and structure the company in such a way that it cannot be commercialised. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I mean, recently was approached um, by a girl who had, I think, ended up with 16% of her, and it's not, it hasn't, she hasn't even raised any capital yet. So by the time it gets to the end? She'll have nothing. nothing. Well, the thing is, no one will, like, no one, an international VC would look at that and go, I'm not investing in that. There's way too much founder risk. There's no incentive for them. Mm. Don't like they've just asymmetrically stacked it, mm. um, and it's just not fair fundamentally. And that was one of the things. That was the reason why I didn't commercialize Humblebee through university. And the fact that it's still happening is pretty infuriating. And the fact that you can't get funding for early stage ideas if you're outside of a university, is is kind of bonkers to me. Right. And so this event that you want to mm. run is to educate young people yeah. on how, and it might not be young people, it could be all ages, couldn't it? Yeah. And how to teach them to navigate this. Or just the kind of the kind of terms that they might be proposed and what that will do to the investability of the company right. um, and resources to push back on um, that, it will, that will give them ammunition to push back on them, um, ways of negotiation, different clauses um, that will benefit will benefit them. Um, and just really the, the idea that you can actually push back because when I t- have challenged universities on this, they've gone, oh, the students know it's a negotiation. And I'm like, they're 20. Yeah. And you are throwing the full force of the university's intellectual property office at it, yeah. at them. So, you know, the power imbalance is profound. So, yeah. Yeah, and and the vulnerable and, you know, yeah. all of that. And then also it goes again, we have this whole number eight wire, Freds and Sheds, like tinkery inventor type attitude that we're all very proud of. And then the story and the stories that we tell of successful people like that, none of them would have got funding. They would have had to go to a university, give up sixty percent of their intellectual property, and pay for the pleasure of it. Right. Right. And you want to create a different route. I do. I want our universities to think more longer term and go. It's going to be way better if we become a university that has a reputation for producing companies that are multi-million dollar revenue producing companies yep. than if we are able to extract. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So actually have the multiplier effect rather than a diminishing effect. Totally. And, and control everything. Yeah. Yeah. Is there another way, though... So you've got universities. There must be other avenues other than universities. 
Is that it? There's one, there's a, a place in Auckland called Level 2, which is a, a technology kind of hire, you can hire lab space there. Uh, it's very new. Um, but if I was, say, for example, to be a, a gene coder and be tinkering with a, a sequence and I have a PCR machine and a DNA printer in my garage because you can buy that stuff mm. online uh, and I want to have that be proven out and I want to go and, and there's now this level two that I can go to. I couldn't get funding because it'd be too early for investors and government funding is tied up through universities. What other models exist around the world, Veronica, that are operating really well in this space? Um, just having more kind of fast-fail cash available to people who are credible and have a credible plan. Yep. So some US-based uh, investors and actually some people from the Edmund Hillary Fellowship have said, and said to me early on, like, why are you taking investor money at this early stage? Right. And I said, well, there's, you know, they, they said, well, you should be getting government grants. I was like, there aren't any. And, you, and, and the ones that you can get, you have to have private equity investment. You have to have it matched. And they went, no, no, that's not right. And then they looked and they're absolutely right. And, and I was and, right. And know. what countries were they from? The US. Right. And the UK. Right. Yeah. Israel gets lots of publicity in this space. I'm not sure in biotech, but certainly in tech, that they are the start-up wizards of the world. Mm. Is that the same sort of thing, ecosystem, where they can fast-track companies and support them? Just more avenues for um, commercialisation yeah. rather than just academic institutions. Yeah. Because yeah. apparently Israel lists more companies on the NASDAQ than Europe does. Wow. And during the last uh, recession, Israel increased their funding in start-up by the government, which was your point, mm. the government by three times of what it was. Yeah. So they did the opposite to everybody yeah. else. They increased the funding. Totally, and, and I think we we should too. And we, and we have, like, um, I was talking to an Australian investor of mine, and he was going, you know, what's been the response uh, for COVID in New Zealand? And when the wage subsidy first came out and it was only for companies that could show on their books that they had a reduction in revenue, that meant that the kind of 10-year pipeline of deep tech right. was got, got completely missed. So pre-revenue companies, people who had raised $10 million had invested, you know, five of that in hardcore infrastructure that was costing them a lot of money that would go on to be, you know, the billion dollar companies um, that we so, that we so desperately need. And we say we want, um, they weren't eligible mm. and they were still, and they were going to be hemorrhaging all of the capital that they had just raised, staying afloat. And then they would have to raise again at the same valuation and, 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 you know, massively cripple the company and all of the, Investors in New Zealand, the angels, the venture capital firms that had invested in those companies would lose all of their capital investment mm. overnight when those companies went went under. And so the government listened and extended it to pre-revenue companies and forecasted revenue, uh, which included capital raise. So we were suddenly able to to be included in that because we had planned to go to Europe and America and raise millions of dollars and then we and then COVID happened and right. here we are so they have this wage subsidy and the extension to pre-revenue companies has saved the deep tech sector in New Zealand yeah the, the tech sector now is becoming a real player in New Zealand's economy yeah I think it is the fourth I've heard two figures. It's either the second biggest exporter or the fourth biggest exporter wow. in, in New Zealand. And you go, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, I suppose tourism doesn't exist anymore. 
But uh, the thing I love about the tech sector is that when the company is up and going, they actually pay people really well. Mm. Um, and you know, we've got a, a, a member, Spider Tracks. That, you know, you know, and you go in there. Mm. It's the League of Nations. You've got every nationality under the sun there, mm. more than you know, uh, just about any other company I've seen. And they're good jobs. Like they're not, you know, Amazon factory jobs. Yeah, that's right. It's a healthy. I and I might have a skewed view on this, but to me, it looks a really healthy industry. Uh, and vibrant, yeah, from the outside. So, Veronica, to wrap up, what heaven? What? How would you like to end this interview? Is there anything, different question, is there anything we've <laughs> missed? Oh, gosh. Um, I think as much as I've just bagged on universities and academic institutions, there is, if, if we could just kind of unhamstring the innovation and the creativity there from the bureaucracy, there are so many amazingly creative people with access to incredible resources. Um, and I think that that would be a huge game changer. And I'd love to see that happen. I'd love to be a part of making that happen. Mm. And now that I'm kind of here for the foreseeable future, as we all are, trapped in this little bubble utopia, um, yeah, I'm going to do... That's something you're going to focus on. Yeah, I mean, this the story I heard really recently um, about this this young woman who'd had um, her company kind of taken away from her her intellectual property that she'd spent her time to a PhD developing. I just thought, like, I can't believe this is still happening. Um, and yeah, that's something that I want to, I can and, and want to contribute to. And am you relatively uniquely positioned because I haven't got. I'm not attached to a university yep. um, and I do understand the ecosystem and I can see it changing. I can see some appetite. So there's a little bit of momentum that I want to build on. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with that. Thank you. And good luck with Humble Bee. Thank you. I am really interested to see where this thing ends up because it's been, you know, I've been watching for a, a long time. I understand a lot more. After today, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's fascinating when you talk about this stuff and I'm just like, I'm like a Labrador. Yeah. And you go, wow. It's something that um, I get more excited about because I, I really, I think of nature as the, and we're talking about recipe books, um, as the greatest library ever created and we've just figured out how to read it and there's a there's an incredible opportunity there look that is a great analogy i've mm. never heard i haven't heard that before yeah yeah that is a great analogy and it also i think frames how much we stand to lose with every species lost yep yep yeah which goes on every day it goes on every day yep yeah Yep, so reading from the Library of Nature. Mm. Veronica, thank you for your time. My pleasure. And good luck with Humble Bee and with these other ventures of sorting out the tech sector and the universities and that stuff. And, yeah, look look forward to, to watching this next part of the journey. Thank you. You've just been listening to an episode of Stuff That Matters Now brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I hope you enjoyed listening to the fun stuff, the rugged stuff and the complete stuff up that have helped this particular Collective Intelligence member evolve while making the world a better place. Do check out our Stuff That Matters Now podcast series on your favourite podcast provider or visit our website www.collectiveintelligence.co.nz to get links to new episodes. 
contact us if you want to learn more about how we can help you evolve yourself and others. Thanks for listening.